Good morning to everyone, especially our visitors. We're very thankful that you've chosen to be with us this morning. We are lower in numbers because we have so many people who are sick or in the hospital, but we are glad that each one who is here is present. And we hope that we will make your attendance worthwhile in the next few moments as we go together and study from the Word of God. We began last week a series on attitudes, and we want to continue that series this morning. Because as Christians work together in a local congregation, having the right attitudes is essential. We said that there may be a lot of talent, but all the talent in the world cannot make up for wrong attitudes. For it is with the right attitudes, our efforts in service to the Lord are enhanced, and they live up to their full potential. Last week, we pointed out four areas of concern in this matter. Having a proper attitude toward God, having a proper attitude toward ourselves as individuals, having a proper attitude toward our brethren, and finally, our attitude toward the work that we do together as a church. In at least these four areas, we must be sure to maintain a proper attitude if we're going to be successful, if we're going to be the kind of church that the Lord would have us to be, if we're going to be the kind of individuals that the Lord would have us to be. Now, in our lesson last week, for those who may not have been here, we saw the attitudes we are to have in relation to God and in relation to ourselves. There's so many that we could name that time would forbid us from listing all of them. But we believe these are the most important, the most essential. As we talk about attitudes toward God, there's the attitude of love. The first commandment with promise is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That must be the place where we begin as we love God and have faith in God, trust God, that all that he commands of us is right and proper. Everything that he commands of us is for our good. And therefore, we must have implicit faith in him, trust him in every way. The final attitude we saw last week in relationship to God was thankfulness. We need to be grateful to our God. Were it not for his grace, his mercy, and his love, all of us would have no hope. All of us would stand wanting because all of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And therefore, we would be condemned because sin separates one from God and ends up in eternal separation in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone unless we're forgiven of that sin. But because God loved us, he sent his son to be that propitiation for our sins. And thus, we can have our sins forgiven, remitted, and stand before him whole. We need to be grateful to God for that every day. Then we looked at some attitudes that we need to have towards ourselves. The first attitude, as our attitude toward God started with love, our attitude to ourselves needs to be humility. We need not to have big egos. We need to be servants of one another. We need to follow the example of Jesus for he gave in John the 13th chapter when with his disciples in that upper room, he stooped to wash their feet telling them that he was doing this, giving them an example that they should serve one another, be humble individuals. We need to be humble. We need to possess teachability. There's never a point in time where we can feel satisfied that we've learned all that we need to learn, that we need to be individuals who are constantly hungering and thirsting for righteousness, seeking to know and to understand more of the will of God. And finally, we noted in our attitudes toward ourselves, we need to have honesty toward mistakes. We all make mistakes, and we all need to recognize those mistakes, and not just recognize them, but learn from them, not allow them to deter us from serving our God and serving others, but at the same time, being individuals who, when they make mistakes, will honestly view them and admit to them, but learn from them so that we might do better. Those were our attitudes we looked at last week. But today's lesson, the second in the series, 
we are going to continue focusing on attitudes so we can better accomplish that which God desires of this local church and of each one of us. And so our series is Attitude is Everything. We're going to be looking at attitudes toward our brethren that we need to have that will help us focus on what we need to be doing and who we need to be and how we need to view our brethren. As we begin, the attitude that we have toward God with love, so it is with our brethren. Jesus taught us in that upper room the necessity of loving our brethren. In the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, in verse 34, he told those who were present with him, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This lets us know how important it is to be those individuals who properly view one another, who love one another and prize one another when we come together. That's one of the beauties that we have, that we can have one another to lean upon, to learn from, to strengthen us, to edify us. We have been born again so that we might love one another fervently. Look at what the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. He said, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abide forever. We need to have that kind of love toward one another. And if we do, if we truly love one another, we should be able to work together as we should, appreciating one another, valuing one another, which leads us to cooperating with one another. Cooperation involves a willingness to work together as God intended. We're not able to just work, but to work together. And that's one of the reasons that God brings us together. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, in verse 21, as the Apostle Paul was illustrating the church by the human body, he said in verse 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Every portion of the body is essential. And we are the body of Christ. And we need to view every member as essential. And we need to view one another as being important helpful as we seek to cooperate with one another. Andrew Carnegie, you may be familiar with the name, he was an industrious, the founder of Carnegie Steel. He said, it marks a big step in a man's development when he comes to realize that other men can be called on to help him do a better job than he can do alone. We need one another. And we need to have that attitude one with another. We need to cooperate one with another. For where there is cooperation, there's productivity. So many times, sadly, congregations look upon maybe just the preacher being the one responsible for all the work being done. Well, he needs to do his share and maybe a little more than others who comprise the congregation. But all of us need to be workers. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 10. And we all need to be accomplishing those good works, cooperating with one another as we do, which will lead us to have an appreciation for others. We need to appreciate what others are doing. There are a number of passages in the New Testament scripture that let us know that is the case. In 1 Corinthians 12, again, going back to Paul's illustration of the church by the physical body, in verse 13 he says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. We comprise the body here in this place, or wherever you may be located as a, a member of the Lord's body. But the point is, we need to recognize and appreciate all who comprise that body and be thankful for them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, the apostle by inspiration said, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, 
and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. We need not only have love for one another, we need to esteem one another, respect one another, be thankful for one another. For true appreciation for others will eliminate destructive criticism. It will eliminate gossip, divisiveness, schisms, factions. All of those things will pass away if we have the proper attitude toward one another and appreciate one another and thankful for one another. I don't know who said it, but I thought this was a very good quote. Expressing appreciation is like grease on the gears of a machine. It makes others do their work much better. Quite often I've <clears throat> talked and, about preachers and many times people become satis dissatisfied with the preacher. And I said, if, if you really want to get rid of your preacher, I've got an easy way to do it. Just keep thanking him, telling him you appreciate him and that you value him and he'll work himself to death. That's the way we are. We all like to be appreciated. We don't do it just for that appreciation, but at the same time, every member of the Lord's body needs to be appreciated for their value. Another ha attitude we need to have is to be submissive to one another. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 tells us we are to submit to one another. For context, let's begin at verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, <coughs> pardon me, and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. God expects us to, write, to have the right attitude toward one another. And one of those attitudes is to submit to one another. Don't be wise in your own opinions, but listen to others. Consider others. We are to admit, submit, for example, no question, to those in positions of leadership. If there are elders in the congregation, Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. You see, the Lord wants us to submit to those who have the oversight when elders are present so that we might not make their task difficult because that would be unprofitable for us. But somebody has said, the old saying is, that too many chiefs and not enough Indians <coughs> Pardon me. It's a common problem in many organizations and in many churches. <coughs> Pardon me. Another attitude is to be peaceable. Peace among brethren is something that we should. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Just getting over this. <coughs> Hopefully this will help. Peace among brethren is something we should pursue. It is part of walking worthy of our calling according to Ephesians chapter 4. Romans 14, 19, Paul said, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace, the things by which one may edify one another. So it is that the true children of God are those who are peacemakers, who sow good deeds of righteousness in the atmosphere of peace. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall see God in Matthew chapter 5. James wrote in James chapter 3 verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We ought to be those individuals who are peaceable individuals, gentle 
individuals, not harsh and stern, willing to yield to the thoughts, the opinions of others, full of mercy towards those who may be having problems and producing good fruits so that others might follow the example being set without partiality, that we show love, patience, kindness, compassion toward all. And that we're not hypocrites, not claiming to be one thing and in actuality another. Another attitude we need to have, and sometimes it's neglected, is to be hospitable. Christians are to be hospitable. In that wonderful chapter, Romans chapter 12, verse 13, it tells us that we are definitely to be hospitable individuals. And this includes both hospitality to strangers and to brethren. Hebrews 13 and verse 2, <laughs> do not forget to entertain strangers for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels, just as the example of Abraham was. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4 and verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. It seems to me that a factor in the rapid spread of the church in the first century was the hospitality that was extended by Christians. In his third epistle, the Apostle John wrote, verse 5, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for brethren and for strangers, who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We, therefore, ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers with the truth to care about those who are carrying the gospel to others, to help them in any way that we can. We're going to look at three attitudes together, but in reality, they form one attitude. That's warmth, friendliness, and openness. We see this expressed by those who comprise the church in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2, just prior, or just, I should say, after this church became a reality, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and divided them all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This was the beginning. These were individuals who were grateful for their salvation, who were rejoicing in the fact that they were children of God, saved from their sins. It is that attitude of graciousness, happiness, joy, out of which the idea of warmth, friendliness, and openness comes. This attitude continued with the saints at Antioch, those who comprised the first Gentile church. In the 11th chapter of Acts, verse 27, in those days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they did also and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. I want you to notice something about this. First of all, they were caring about brethren that they'd never met. They didn't know these people. And also remember, this was the first Gentile church, and the church in Jerusalem was made up of, of Jews. And therefore, Jews and Gentiles had never gotten along under this point. So these Gentiles were putting aside that fact, and they were giving themselves wholly to their Jewish brethren in Jerusalem. But I want you to notice something else. In verse 29 it says, Then the disciples, each according to his ability. This wasn't something that was done by a few. This was something that was done by each and every one of them. Every one of them felt this compulsion. Every one of them showed compassion, warmth towards their brethren. It's an attitude we need to have. Then there's the attitude of gentleness or meekness. This is especially necessary when dealing with those who are spiritually weak. 
In the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse one. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. When we're dealing with those who, has, who have been overtaken in sin, the apostle, by inspiration, said we need to be gentle with them and try to bring them back. It's also essential when dealing with those who oppose us. So many times, there are those who become very angry almost at those who oppose. But look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God, perhaps, will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him, to do his will. Even those who we might consider enemies, even those who oppose us. This says, don't get into quarrel with them. Teach them. Be patient with them. Try to help them as best as possible. Which leads us to the idea of forgiveness, forbearance, patience, and long-suffering. Again, though there may be four <laughs> items there, they're all one with another, and they all overlap, and they all are very important. Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now notice, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Loneliness, humility, we talked about that. Gentleness, we've talked about that. Being long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, having that attitude of love will allow us to bear even with those who are having a difficult time. Later in that chapter, verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Tenderhearted to one another. Kind to one another. That's the attitude of heart. If we're going to work together, if we're going to appreciate one another, if we're going to be successful in doing the Lord's will, we must be kind, devoted, compassionate individuals. As we bring our lesson to a close, Ideal attitudes make for ideal working conditions among the members of any local church. The attitudes we have considered in this lesson will help the cause of Christ wherever it is, in any congregation. The attitudes we have studied will improve our relationship with God, improve our relationship with ourselves, brethren, and our work. It will make us useful to the Master prepared for every good work, each one of us feeling that responsibility to be a part of the work that is being accomplished. The question is, do we have or are we developing the right kind of attitudes? I hope we have them. And if not, I hope we'll be working on them and doing those things which will cause us to have the proper attitudes that the scriptures present to us. If this morning you have a need to make your life right with God, maybe your attitudes have not been as good as they should have been. Or maybe you're having a problem, a weakness that you're striving to overcome. Or quite possibly, you've never given obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Whatever your need may be, we stand ready to help you. We have the <clears throat> abilities to go to the scripture let you know what you need to do in order to be forgiven of that which is in your life or to help you be strengthened to overcome any problem. If you have a need, let us know how we can help you with it. We're going to be singing number 285 that Robert's going to lead us in. And if you have such a need and we can help you with it, let us know by coming forward while we stand and while we sing.